welcome everyone to the Friday invited plenary address. And um, I hope you can all get in and take your seats quickly and call people from the hallway so we've got more people coming in. Great. Um, the conference has just been very energizing and I thank you all for all the um, good work that you've been bringing to the conference. Um, I think you're going to find tonight's plenary a, um, a recharge, um, if not a charge, for all of us tonight. Um, before we begin, I have a few brief announcements I want to share. First, please turn off your cell phones or place them on vibrate. Secondly, immediately following the plenary, we have the LRA annual business meeting from 6 to 6.20 in this room. If you've never attended a business meeting, this is the time to learn more about what has transpired over the past year with LRA. It's the time when the future sites for the conference will be revealed and um, various other business aspects of the conference, including our budget. Um, later this evening, um, an in memoriam gathering for Arthur Appleby and Alan Farstrup to beloved members of both LRA and just the literacy field in, in general, um, both of whom passed away this year. That memoriam will be held in um, Orchard 1 and 2 in the lower level of this building. And David Pearson and Ginny Goatley are providing pizza, beer, and soft drinks. So it's a, it's a wake, really. Um, and please, please join everyone in celebrating their lives and legacies. We also invite you to attend Vital Issues tonight from 9 to midnight in the Diversions um, Bar area hosted by the LRA Field Council. And for a change of pace, you might want to enjoy the Vital Issues Pachecacha in the Executive Learning Center from 9 to 11, which um, entails a lot of slides. <laughs> um, next, we turn to the Edward Fry Book Award I'd like to introduce Dr. Barbara Bradley, Bradley from the University of Kansas, who's the chair of the award committee. I have the distinct honor of presenting this year's Edward B. Fry Book Award. This award is given annually to members to a member or members of LRA who have written or co-authored a book within the last five years that advances our knowledge about literacy, displays inquiry into literacy, and shows responsible intellectual risk-taking. Before doing so, I would like to thank our committee members who so diligently read the nominated books. If you are here, please stand. Jan Blake, Monica Gordon Percy, Jen Graff, Marsha Invernese, Pat Isaacs, Judd Lauder, Catherine Mendoroso, Ileana Reyes, and Bo Gunyun. Again, thank you for your many hours of reading many, many books. <laughs> this year, as in past years, there were numerous outstanding books competing for the award. However, I am pleased to announce the winners of this year's Edward B. Fry Book Award, Evelyn Arisby, Therese Kolner and Carmen Martinez Roldan for their book, Visual Journey Through Wordless Narrative, an International Inquiry with Immigrant Children and the Arrival. Their book examines the potential of wordless, pic wordless picture books to support immigrant children as learners and meaning makers. Dr. Arisby, Kolmer, and Martinez Roldan ask us to consider how participation in visual response strategies and discussions of wordless postmodern texts support recent immigrant children as readers. As committee members wrote, these international researchers and their book demonstrate how research through responsible risk taking advances our knowledge about what literacy means by pushing our thinking about and understanding of comprehension without the constraints of written words. By taking a global perspective, they highlight how young children develop and live language and literacy according to their own realities and various communities around the world. Further, these researchers focus our attention on visual literacies 
and multimodalities of vital modes of communicate as vital modes of communication, as well as how societal narratives are reinforced or rewritten through transactional experiences. Please join me in congratulating Evelyn Arispe, Teresa Colmer, and Carmen Martinez Roldan, the 2015 Edward B. Fry Book Award winners. Gracias, Barbara, and all the members of the Edward B. Fry Book Award Committee for this honor. I am delighted to accept this award on behalf of my co-authors, Evelyn Arispe from the University of Glasgow, Teresa Colomer from the Universitat Autónoma de Barcelona, and the group of 10 collaborators who contributed to the successful development of the international study presented in the book. We are humbled and deeply happy, for we see this award as a support to research that brings immigrant children's voices to the forefront in discussions on literacy in these critical times. They couldn't make it here, but um, they are excited about this uh, award. The main objective of our inquiry was to explore the responses of immigrant students from different backgrounds to wordless picture books in order to understand how they construct meaning from visual images in complex narratives about immigration, journeys, and the visual image itself, with the intention not only of theorizing, but of creating strategies that can support their literacy skills, as well as help them reflect on their own or others' experiences of migration. The book focuses on the children's responses to the arrival by Sean Tan. Taken together, the four contexts of the study, Glasgow, Barcelona, US, and more later, Italy, the participant children's backgrounds represented 25 different countries from Latin America, Africa, Europe, and Asia. The research project built on the richness of such diversity and on the immigrant children's strengths, visual literacies, and experiences. We acknowledge how complex immigration issues are in each region and how broad generalizations cannot be applied. However, the migration situation shows a ground that is rich in possibilities for language and literacy learning and not only of English or the main language or variety of each region. In our study, the children often cross the border between the story in the book and their own lives. They shared experiences of gaining and losing languages and the hardships of the immigrant experience. They claimed unique knowledge as immigrants, as one of them stated, no es lo mismo imaginar que sentir. It is not the same to imagine as to feel. In all four contexts, the children's responses represented immigrants as dignified workers, whether it was the protagonists in the arrival or their own relatives, as another student affirmed, porque nosotros venimos a trabajar, because we come to work, a representation that results in a sharp contrast to the negative ideological discourses about immigrants that circulate today. The children, the children engaged, thank you, with the visual affordances of the arrival and engage in meaning making through retellings, inferences, and visual responses. Our research confirms that wordless picture books demand a heightened co-authoring role that requires taking risks with the imagination, activating intertextual and cultural knowledge, using all these resources to make inferences while at the same time being open to constantly revising interpretation and meaning in collaboration with others. Given the right context, one that focuses more on meaning making than on getting the right response or showing language proficiency, recent immigrant children can engage in such literate practices and interpretive processes. I don't want to end without mentioning the international collaboration among the research team as a crucial aspect of the study. The diversity of the researchers help us engage in collaborative inquiry 
as a form of intercultural exchange and learning. However, it also presented us with challenges. One of these was the negotiation of different analytical frameworks and epistemologies that inspired the various research traditions of each team. This negotiation was part of our research journey, as we all had to cross invisible borders in order to learn from others, so that in the end of this collaboration, we could create something new that would work for all of us and for our particular data. It was definitely an expansive learning process. Finally, and in a more personal note, I want to thank my husband and family for their unconditional support and also the many scholars with whom I have interacted in academia for the last 20 years, who have supported so generously my thinking and work, some of them who are here today, including my body, Carmen Medina, whose forward thinking and writing has inspired me so much. Gracias, colega, and mil gracias, the LRC community. like to introduce um, Rebecca Rogers of the University of Min Missouri um, and Vice President of LRA, who will introduce Dr. Michelle Klein. It is my great honor to introduce Dr. Michelle Klein to, uh, to us this afternoon. Dr. Michelle Klein is a distinguished professor of critical psychology, women's studies, American studies, in urban education at the Graduate Center CUNY. Fine is a university teacher, educational activist, and researcher who works on social justice projects with youth, women, men, in prison, educators, and social movements on the ground. In her memoir, she writes, as we bear witness in our homes and in our research, in our nation and across the globe, where and how do we situate our ethical obligation to speak back? We'll never, she writes, I write. Maybe if I write, then you, policymakers, readers, students, friends, colleagues, strangers, may catch the contagion of outrage. You and we will be electrified to action, no longer petrified to passivity or despair. And she has authored many classic books and articles on high school pushouts, adolescent sexuality, the impact of college and prison, the struggles and brilliance of children of incarcer incarcerated adults, the wisdom of Muslim American youth. She writes on the injustice of high stakes testing, the racial abuse of mass uh, incarceration of people of color and queer youth, and she loves to conduct research with young people who know intimately the scars of injustice and the laughter of surviving the streets of New York. A pioneer in the field of youth participatory action research and a founding faculty member of the Public Science Project, Fine has been involved with a series of participatory action research projects with youth and elders from across different racial, ethnic, and social class backgrounds to investigate circuits of dispossession and circuits of critical resistance. She is a much sought after witness in gender, sexuality, and race discrimination education cases. Fine's research and testimony have been influential in the victories of women who sued for access to the Citadel Military Academy and in Williams v. California, a class action lawsuit for urban youth of color denied adequate education in California. Most recently, Fine, Maria Elena Torre, and a participatory action research team, including women from the Bedford Hills Correctional Facility, published Changing Minds, the Impact of College on Women in Prison, which is nationally recognized as the primary empirical basis for the contemporary college in prison movement. She has received numerous national and international awards for her scholarship, and it's an honor to have, us here, to have her here with us today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Michelle Fine. the best audience. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, so thank you, Pat, for inviting me. I feel like 
the first cousin who comes to an organization that I have some intimacy with because I was at the University of Pennsylvania when Del Himes was the dean and um, so many of the L LRA members uh, were teaching there, were connected. The Ethnography and Education Conference is a first cousin to LRA, I assume. Perry Gilmar is in my heart. Um, so I have a many part presentation, but I was so inspired by the amazing talks by Gloria and Norma, anybody else? Yeah, it's kind of like being on a baseball team, a metaphor I've never used in my life, and the two people in front of you hit home runs, and you think, could we like have a seventh inning stretch? Um, but as I said last night, in a kind of um, post-menopausal synchrony with Gloria and Norma, I too will tell stories um, of how literacy came to me through the maternal lineage, but I learned to tell stories because my mother didn't tell stories because she kind of was depressed in her silence. And maybe some of you have those stories too of why we tell stories because our mothers couldn't. Um, so um, my parents, different than Gloria's and Norma's. Um, they came to this country separately when they were seven. They were Jews from Poland. My mother was the youngest of 18 children. My father was an orphan. Um, and so I feel so fortunate to be the child of immigrants. But I also know the complexity of, of those early years, the kind of shame and then shame that you feel shame kind of the language was a little wrong, and uh, my parents spoke some Yiddish, as I was saying to Yeda, who is, you know, Yeda and I, I think, are separated at birth. Um, but uh, my parents came to this country at that moment that Karen Brodkin Sachs calls when the Jews became white. It was that moment when our country said, hey, immigrants, cool, come. I have a fantasy that there were like a couple of capitalists at Ellis Island who like pointed to my dad and said, let's have that one make it, right? So my dad sold plumbing supplies um, and I grew up in a plumbing supply family, but, um, I, and I was my mother's youngest. So she was the youngest of 18 and I was her youngest by a fair amount. And so I remember living in New Jersey and my brother and sister and dad would leave the front door to America and I would be home with a very depressed mother. Anybody have this story? Yeah, there's a lot of these stories. And, and um, so she would lay in bed with a shmata. If you don't know what a shmata is, you shouldn't be in LRA. It's, um, <laughs> it's, like a, it's like a wet rag that you have on your head when you have a headache and when you're depressed and when you're an immigrant and when you're carrying that like white woman oppression in your body so that your good daughter could watch it and grow up and be a feminist. That's what a shmata is. <laughs> And I have to say that as I sat there watching Lucy or whatever with my frosted flakes, I had in some ways a desire to flee out the front door to America with my brother and sister and my dad. And I knew that that amazing woman who I lost just a few years ago, Rose Fine, four foot eight, all breasts. Anybody know that woman? <laughs> yeah. Um, then I knew she had wisdom, I knew she had love, I knew she, she knew a lot. Um, and when she was dying, I, I was reading a book to her that my friend Kathy Boudin, who had been in prison, um, gave to me. And Kathy had read the book to her mother when her mother was dying. It was a book of letters from mothers to daughters. It was written by Grace Paley, who was friends with Kathy's mother. And so Kathy was reading the stories to her mom from prison on the phone and then she gave me the book and I was reading it to my mother. And um, my mother said, I have so many stories to tell. And of course me, I'm like, really, tell me, I'll write it. And she said, I can't, they're written on my heart, you tell them. So that's what brings me to love story, but also to know that for every story of progress, is a story of depression. For every dominant story about how good things are, somebody's paying a price. 
I'll leave you with that. It'll become clear why that's important. I also had the good fortune to be friends with Paolo Ferrere. And um, when Paolo was in New York, probably 30 years ago, he said something like, whoever possesses and controls our textual world possesses a significant part of the hegemonic landscape. Whoever possesses and controls our textual world possesses our significant part of our hegemic hegemonic landscape. And then last Friday, Rupert Murdoch tweeted that Eli Broad might be purchasing the LA Times. And I thought, wow, I wish I could call Paolo. So whether this is rumor or not, the intimacies of mainstream media, privately funded evidence, corporate education, and state policymakers is growing more obvious, more entwined, and more insidious. The dominant story has money, they now have the newspapers, and they have legitimacy, and they've got a lot of power, even in Obama's Washington, D.C. The New York Times and the LA Times routinely report very partial, presumably empirical documentation of the failure of traditional schools and the miracles of charter schools. They demonize unions and educators while characterizing those of us who question Common Core, TFA, charters, testing in preschool or the closings of schools as defenders of the status quo, as whiny, as uncivil. In New Jersey, where I live, the tragedy of the illiterate African-American child is foreplay to privatization shows up in the paper on Monday, and the next week the schools are being shut and converted. The public sector is indeed undergoing a strategic, racialized, and classed makeup, but the disruptions, the betrayals, and the profits are being scrubbed from the headlines. And in what we might affectionately call the neoliberal corporate creep, like creep <laughs> or creep, um, <laughs> I want to suggest that higher ed and professional organizations have not been immune, and at times we have been complicit. Like public universities at large, graduate schools of education experience enormous pressure to bear right. And most of them have turned on their blinkers. While faculty at numerous universities, including Arizona, Wisconsin, CUNY, Rutgers, UMass, Texas, Boston College, to name a few, have vocally challenged high stakes testing, ETPA, Common Core, Eurocentric curriculum, charter expansion, xenophobia, racism on campus, those faculty have endured harassment from corporate reform groups, from state legislators, and often our university administrators just watch. Just last week, Governor Cuomo threatened to deregister teacher education programs if fewer than 50% of their graduates pass state exams over three years. The racialized and classed implications of these seemingly banal technical decisions are enormous for who we teach and who we turn away. Many are writing obituaries on the slow death of public education. I prefer to cast the present moment instead as one of deep and critical contestation where we might ask with whom and to whom are we accountable. Gloria Anzaldua would remind us that in every river there are multiple currents. And right now we are swimming in a river of corporate currents, of neoliberal currents, but also of deep, radical, protesting currents. Indeed, this is a revolting <laughs> moment. Globally and nationally, there are many, many victories, underreported, but they're important for us to remember. In South Africa, the Statue of Rhodes fell, and so did the college fees after years of students and faculty protesting. In Chile, there will be free college tuition after labor, students, minors, and educators all protested in solidarity. In 
in Canada, the, there was a TRC on the indigenous boarding schools and they produced a very powerful document. I encourage you to read, I think it's a 900 page executive summary, but I encourage you to read it. I was at Lee Patel and I were at this amazing conference where the dean of a law school said, we are now gonna have to rewrite our curriculum. Our entire cur first year curriculum is settler colonial law. It's contracts and real estate and individual rights. We all know about the amazing football players at Mizzou. Yeah, we had to revise our stereotypes, of, right? I did anyway. Teachers in Seattle refused to, uh, submit, um, to administer the high stakes standardized test and eventually it was defeated. Students in Newark, New Jersey sat in on Superintendent Cami Anderson's office for 72 hours and she had to resign. Activists in Philadelphia hung an art exhibit of artifacts from more than 50 schools closed by the current cocktail of austerity and corporate charter regimes. Students organized against institutional racism at Boston College and flew a banner over graduation that said eradicate racism at Boston College. The number of states implementing the Common Core is now bupkis. You know bupkis? Very, very little. Very, just a handful. California policymakers repealed their graduation tests and California, Georgia, South Carolina, and Arizona had to give diplomas retroactively to students who were denied the right to graduate because of high stakes test scores. Alternative assessments are being developed in New Hampshire, New York, and California, and Florida pushed back on Jeb Bush's third grade, third grade test promotion policy. In 2015, half a million students opted out of high stakes testing, and more than 800 high-end universities do not require the SAT or the ACT. Black Lives Matter, climate justice, and the fight for 15 have galvanized thousands. And on December 3rd, 2015, in Carlsbad, California, from the back of a room after Gloria Ladston Billings spoke about deficit thinking, Ken Goodman said, we created that research, we're to blame the beginning of a decolonizing process. Across K through 12 and higher education, energetic, courageous, and dedicated sweat equity coalitions of educators, youth, community members, activists, and researchers are stitching together solidarity movements. But it's premature to call hospice on corporate ed reform. In response to the massive, energized, intersectional mobilizations of resistance, I want us to be wary of a turn we might call SCARE, S-C-A-R-E, stratified corporate assault on research and education. We could call it crap and alter, uh, <laughs> I've had too much time to think about literacy here. Corporate ed reformers seem to recognize that they overreached. Even Hillary Clinton is questioning the selectivity around some of the charter um, miracle outcomes. So we now hear in a discourse of humility, bipartisanship, and a strong irony, a language of choice and freedom, there seems to be a strategic splitting of the corporate agenda, and I want us to worry about this. Seems to me that in white, wealthy, and suburban communities, they're backing off. We're seeing a softening of the assault on all things public becoming private. Art, music, and recess are having a comeback. A series of alternatives are being offered for graduation requirements so those white mothers will stop complaining. In New Jersey, where there's a mandated exit exam, they just offered an SAT alternative. Just think of the chutzpah of offering a paid for alternative. So if you score a five, uh, 400 or above, you don't have to pass the high stakes state exam. 500 is the average for white kids, 400 is the average for black kids. So in a town like Montclair, where we had an incredible opt out rate, lots of people can sit back now. 
In a town like Newark, where we do a lot of solidarity work, something like 65 to 75% of the kids are still in jeopardy of not graduating. In urban communities of color, poverty and um, immigration, in community colleges, and most recently in public preschools serving low-income children, we're witnessing an accelerated appetite for what's called disruptive innovation, testing, teacher evaluation, reading readiness, and the threatened loss of funds if schools have poor metrics. Public schools serving the most disenfranchised students have been stripped of resources, and now they're being marked for punitive accountability regimes. In CUNY, my own institution in 2008 with the financial crisis, lots of kids who were going to private schools upstate bumped into the SUNYs, state universities. Lots of the SUNYs came back home because their families lost money. And what did CUNY do? We jacked up our tuition and we jacked up our SAT scores for the most competitive four-year institutions. So black and brown graduates of New York City public schools today are much more likely to end up in community colleges than they were in 2007. Community colleges were class sizes and the ratio of adjunct faculty swells. Ripping a page out of Naomi Klein's shock doctrine, hundreds of schools across the country have been shuttered. In Chicago, Detroit, Philadelphia, New Orleans, Cincinnati, Newark, handed over to charter management firms allegedly to save them. Disproportionately in black neighborhoods, they've lost their one remaining public institution since branch libraries have closed. The public institutions in those communities are represented by police and military recruiters. We've seen what gets accomplished there. Hundreds of tenured teachers, disproportionately black and brown, have been accessed and replaced by short-term contingent, usually white, educators. In the name of Renaissance 2010, Pauline Lichtman has meticulously cataloged Failing schools in Chicago were closed, they flipped to charters, and now charters are beginning to flip to condominiums. The connection to real estate should not be understated. The Chicago public school faculty has plummeted from 40% to 23% black between 2000 and 2010. In the early 1900s, W.E.B. Du Bois lost, launched Crisis Magazine to chronicle the moans of the darker race which he feared would be ignored until there was a profit to be made. Well, there's a profit to be made. But we know this history well of the United States government stealing land, language, sovereignty, and cultural consciousness from communities of color in the name of the public, civilization, the common good, even in the name of integration. We know this from the writings of Norma Gonzalez, Teresa McCarty, Sheila Nicholas. Um, Lacey Wyman, and many others. But now we have a frightening menage a trois of corporate America, colorblind ideolo ideologues, explicitly racist policymakers, and the state. It makes it hard to defend that which is public. Maybe you already knew that. I feel like a lot of my friends of color already knew this. So maybe this talk is simply a confessional of my epistemology of ignorance cultivated by white privilege and loving the Statue of Liberty because it worked for me. We're at an historic moment of contestation. If you hang out in Newark, which I do on Saturdays at the Freedom Schools, you hear parents and grandparents who have one kid in a charter and one in a traditional school they're scared of the traditional schools. They're mad at the charters for throwing out their kids, for having too many special needs. One grandmother said, I have to pick up my grandson at 12.30 because he acts bad every day after lunch, so I pick him up from the charter school. We were all appalled that that was legal. And then another grandmother said, my grandson is doing really well in his charter school, except I think he's learning to hate being black he doesn't like Newark very much, and they want to send him to a boarding school. And the assault on cultural consciousness that we're witnessing needs to be attended to by all of us. I'm not going to 
I'm going to skip a part, but I just want to tell you that if you, if you haven't heard or read James Anderson's brilliant discussion of the state of black education post-emancipation, where the, there were these kind of dueling constructions of what should the black community take up, I recommend it because it feels like we're in a moment like that now. And he says, ex-slaves atten attentive to create an educational system that would support and extend their emancipation but their children were pushed into a system of industrial education that presupposed black political and economic subordination, and that was supported by northern industrial philanthropists and southern school officials. And because blacks lacked economic and political power, white elites were able to control the structure and content of black elementary, secondary, normal, and college education. Today, I'm afraid white elites still control the structure and content of black education, Latino, indigenous, immigrant, poor white. Or maybe, as Jody Melamud would argue, we witness in this country a multicultural neoliberalism. So it looks like the people who are running this new agenda are very diverse. But their job is to make sure that people of color remain at the bottom. Paulo Freire would tell us we have to think about where we stand at this political moment. He said, washing one's hands of the conflict between the powerful and the powerless means only that we side with the powerful. There is no way to be neutral. Mari Matsuda, uh, a uh, critical race theorist, wrote a book years ago called Where Is Your Body? Asking us to think about to whom we hold ourselves accountable. And for the remainder of my talk, I want us to think as individuals, as researchers who are parts of universities, but also members of LRA. How do we situate our own work, our institutional work, and our professional organizations at, time, at a time when the notion of public is very much up for grabs? Part two. In her book, War Talk, Arundhati Roy writes, our work is to tell a different story than the one we're being brainwashed to believe. Another world is not only possible, she is on her way. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. So in the remainder of my talk, I, I want to um, want to talk to you a little bit about the kind of work that we do where we engage with communities. Through a brief sketch of two projects rooted in critical research participation with highly marginalized young people, I want to offer humble thoughts about how our scholarship could develop a soul. Theoretically, epistemologically, affectively, ethically, and politically. How deep our commitments can grow and our theories when we stand beside, conduct research with, and support inquiry by communities educators, and youth under siege, as Gloria and Norma and so many of you have done. I speak now from the perch of the Public Science Project at the Graduate Center. It's a research collective of researchers, community members, folks in prison, school pushouts, depending on the project, where we take seriously Ignacio Martin Barro's call for research that challenges the dominant lies where we take seriously W.E.B. Du Bois's refusal to conduct downstream social science. You remember he was hired to, to conduct the Philadelphia Negro because Susan Wharton of the Wharton School in 1898 didn't understand why the Negro community kept like getting sick and, and getting um, involved in criminal activity and they had so many troubles. So they hired him to study what was wrong with those people. He knew he was being hired for a racist task, but he took it on and he flipped the script. He refused to confuse the outcome with the cause. And that's where we are now. He refused to consider the dependent variable, the independent variable. And the third person I just want to introduce is that we take seriously Sandra Harding's notion of strong objectivity. If you haven't read Sandra Harding's work on strong objectivity, she's a feminist philosopher who argues that we've confused objectivity with distance, right? So when, uh, 
and we've confused intimacy for, for the lack of objectivity. And what Harding says is if we can get very differently positioned people together and pool our situated knowledges and kind of argue it out the way you were just talking about on your book, right? You get very differently positioned people and you take our differences seriously, you get what she calls strong objectivity. But we have for too long allowed distance and epistemological violence of academics who live very far from the communities they're studying to conduct research that produces what Thomas Teo calls epistemological violence. So at the Public Science Project, for every project in prisons and schools and communities, we gather together those who most intimately carry the stories of injustice in their bellies with community-based practitioners, lawyers, researchers, activists, and we share our pooled knowledge. We interrogate the dominant story. We gather qu data toward a question that is generated by this mixed group. And together, we call this critical public science or critical uh, participatory action research. So for instance, in the South Bronx, We've been studying aggressive policing in the 44th precinct, which has the highest rates of police stops and frisks, the highest rates of innocent stops, 94%, and the highest rates of violence when the cops stop. And it's mostly, mostly it's a young people strategy. They, and there's what's called vertical um, sweeps. So public housing and low income private housing can bring in the NYPD and they do sweeps of the floors and if people don't have ID, they can arrest them for trespassing. So if I'm visiting Yetta's apartment and Yetta's not home, or Yetta is home, um, the police can still, if I don't have the correct ID, arrest me. And this kind of, so in, in the Morris Justice Project, and I've got some materials, we are partnering with grandmothers who for years have been taking too many pictures of their babies getting beaten up by the cops. There's one woman on the seventh floor in this building, on the third floor in this building, and they had a whole, they were already doing PAR, right? They already had community data. They just didn't call it PAR, they just called it being a grandmother in the South Bronx. I'll, I'll refer more to that. Um, critical PAR recognizes that expertise is widely distributed, but legitimacy is not that those who have tasted injustice have an acute understanding of what we call circuits of dispossession and privilege. And when I say circuits, I mean, if you have a high stakes test that's keeping kids from graduating high school, that has consequences for criminal justice, that has consequences for housing, that has consequences for homelessness, that has consequences for healthcare, that we can't continue to study siloed um, oppressive conditions. The other way we look at circuits is if one community is getting a ton of policing and school closings and another community is benefiting from it, we need to conduct research that demonstrates how wealthy communities are gaining resources on the backs of low-income communities and not just focus in the low-income community. So we talk a lot about circuits. We understand that oppression is twinned and circuited with privilege. How am I doing on time? Had, uh, tell me what that means, because you wouldn't <laughs> believe how much I think I have to do. It means 10 minutes? Oh, that's absurd. OK. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I want to give you some examples of PAR projects, just like tapas, like little delicious plates. Um, but I want to tell you that for us, PAR is not a methodology. We do critical statistics, we do ethnographies, we do focus groups, we do large scale surveys, we do mapping. It's an epistemology. It has to do with where we think knowledge lives. Okay? And we try now to conduct research based on what we call solidarity designs bringing together historically oppressed communities with historically privileged communities. For instance, looking at policing in the East Village, which is almost all NYU students who have a lot of contraband, and in the South Bronx, where they actually don't have that much contraband. So we have, I have some materials where we just compare the number of stops, the number of times that people were called the N-word, the F-word, 
the number of times they are thrown to the ground, and the percentage of innocent stops. It will not surprise you that there are many, many, many more stops in the South Bronx than in the NYU neighborhood. It might surprise you that in the NYU neighborhood, the cops are actually pretty good at figuring out when they should stop somebody. So there aren't that many innocent stops because they're really selective. There are about 94% in the South Bronx. All right, I'm gonna, um, I th maybe I just won't read. See, I don't even do that because it takes too much time. All right, I'm gonna tell you two stories and then I have homework assignments for LRA. Can we deal with that? So the first kind of critical science I want to talk about, which my title came from, and then when I was here I thought I should talk about other things, um, is called Flying Monkeys in Court. Over the past 30 years, I've entered the courtroom as an expert witness in a variety of gender and race discrimination cases. I enter with a lot of qualitative material from young people and the responsibility to tell a good enough story. I've testified in the Citadel and Central High and in Wadawi, Alabama. Do you remember when the principal canceled the prom because of biracial dating? Anyway, don't get me started. I'll tell you, I'll tell you later. It's a kind of fascinating project to be called in. When I'm called in to be an expert witness, I say, okay, but I, I wanna come in and do an ethnography of the institution. I don't wanna just present the existing data. So I hang out at the Citadel. Another, a mistake. I hang out at, in Widawi at the black churches where they, they, the principal told the kids, a black girl, um, if you go to prom with a white boy, that's against the rules. And she said, I'm biracial, Sharonda Jones. I'm biracial, who do you want me to take to the prom? And he said, you were a mistake and we're not gonna have any more mistakes. So black families and mixed race families pulled their kids out, set up freedom schools. I drive down with like, memories of Jews driving to Alabama around ra racial justice, not good stories, don't tell my mother, aforementioned mother, she has enough schmatas. And I get there and I think, okay, this is cool, and I'm supposed to meet like 10 elders from the black church. Anybody here go to black churches? So do you know that I did not meet with the 10 elders? I walk in, the place is packed, three different churches, all of whom apparently hate each other, but for this night they all got together, buses, I walk in, think I'll hide in the back. I'm the only white person. Somebody says, praise Jesus, Dr. Fine is here. So I was involved in that case. <laughs> I can't, I, I still have 20 minutes, right? So um, <laughs> I, 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 wanna, I wanna tell you one of the things that courts really love, and, and we should talk about this because I think this is deeply embedded in your work. They like story, our guys, the good guys, they like stories of damage and they like stories of sameness. So when I go to court around racial discrimination or poverty or gender, I am asked to say these young people are so broken because what we have is a court system that equates damage and injustice. We gotta stop that now. Right? We can be able to demonstrate injustice and strength, but it's still unfair. It is not a victory to go to court and say they are so broken, because the other side is now saying to me, doctor, isn't it true that money doesn't matter? That their lives are so awful? Isn't it true that black kids do better with other black kids in school? Using my own research back at me, right? So we've really got to watch for the sameness arguments, and the damage arguments. Is that, I'll, I can go into more details. So when I testified in the Williams case in California here, short version, poor kids go to crappy schools. Um, and I, you know, I, I walk in and I, they arrange for me to interview young people and usually what I do is I have them draw maps and then I give them photographs of well-resourced schools and not so well-resourced schools but first I say, tell me something you love about your school because the other side, talk about discourse analysis, the other side is getting the tapes of my interviews. Okay, so so much for selective editing when we interpret data. So first I say, tell me something you love and something you wish were different. And then at the very end I say, you know, I'm going to court and I'm gonna carry your stories in my belly to the best of my ability. 
what do you want to tell the judge about what a good school looks like? And one little girl said, the daughter of migrant workers, she said, I would just like a school with a seat on every toilet and enough paper to clean yourself. There are, there are um, engineers, Riddle and Weber, who, write, who distinguish wicked problems from soluble problems. Wicked problems are like things that are so hard and crusty and embedded you can't even, ah. and soluble problems are, you can fix them. I go to court with wicked problems trying to sell a soluble story. And sometimes I really worry about who I've left on the cutting room floor. And I think those of you in the literacy business are in the same existential dilemma, all right? All right, with my remaining 20 minutes, um, <laughs> in a recent case, no, I really, I'm, gonna, I'm coming toward the end. Um, in a recent case, I was brought in with two colleagues, um, because this was a lawsuit around extra learning time. Is that like a buzz for any of you for a while? Like we should have longer school days and any, anybody hear that? Like, and did you wonder like why are the Republicans to, I, I still haven't figured it out. Anyway, good lawyers, civil rights lawyers said, you know, Michelle, poor kids go to schools where they have less hours in the day. And it is true, amazing work by John Rogers and Nicole Mira. They've really documented lockdowns and immigration raids and a shooting in the neighborhood and the school closes, long-term subs, somebody's sick, et cetera. There are a million reasons that low-income kids go to school where they have fewer hours. So I said, well, sounds important, but let me talk to some young people because I'm, I'm a little nervous about this. So we went and they arranged focus groups for us. And what we did on this project was, um, first I had them draw, I just bring crayons and metric markers and papers, and I say, draw what time feels like in your body in school. Now, you might think that's a weird question, but actually people made amazing, amazing drawings. We had teachers and we had kids. And some kids who went to well-resourced schools or were in AP classes had pictures like this, right? Some kids would have AP like this and then on the bottom remedial and they'd be prison bars. Some kids drew pictures of clocks where the arm wouldn't move or a snail or a picture of a teacher with the word Nemo next to her because they had a lot of long-term subs, 40 to 60 percent in some schools, long-term subs. And one little boy, Carlos, said, I drew a picture of the yellow brick road. And this is me and my friends and my teachers walking down the yellow brick road. And we're walking toward the green curtain in the back. I don't even know if anybody's behind that green curtain, but I'm just walking. And, I'm st and a lot of my friends are falling off the yellow brick road because of tests or they get shot or they get deported, but I keep walking. And then he says, but what you gotta watch out for, and he points on this map, are the flying monkeys. And so we started, flying monkeys became the metaphor for us of the predictability of the unpredictable. And the story was, went on, oh, it's funny you said flying monkeys. My brothers are in jail, and like I didn't really expect that, so I'm living with my aunt. But every morning, my brothers call me and say, did you do your homework yet, and do you have enough money? Just this morning, they called me to say, so these stories that are supposed to be sad stories, but are funny stories, but are surviving stories, but are resistant stories, kind of an amazing, what we think of now as an epistemology of precarity. That is, these kids are living on the edge. They smell real relationships and they smell drive-by betrayals. They know when we're serious and they know when we're not gonna deliver. Thank you. <laughs> they expect terrible things to happen and they yearn for good things to happen. And so we wrote a lot about the wisdom and the pain embedded in an epistemology of precarity. It is not just a sad story, it is that. But there is a wisdom, a knowledge. For those of you who were shocked and, and horrified by Paris because we missed Mali and Lebanon and Syria and 
Baltimore and, and, and we're all in this, right? These are young people who, but, but they're not, they're not um, callous. They're just wise and they have a lot to teach us about what it means to live in an unpredictable world. I, um, I was at a conference of disruptive innovators. Do you know this term, disruptive innovators? Anyway, that's what they call themselves. I, I was at a conference of innovators, and they were all quite, and these were all black innovators, and I was the white woman because I was friends with the guy. And they were all quoting Mark Zuckerberg, who apparently says the motto is move fast and break things. That's the innovator's motto. Eli Broad also says it. So I got up and I said, I hang out in neighborhoods with kids where you um, move fast, you broke things, and you left, right? So these are young people who live in the drive-by. In our very last focus group, in a community setting where there was more despair than oxygen, after I explained the purpose of the focus groups and that longer school days was being framed as a civil right. One young man said, lady, you seem really nice, <laughs> but please don't make us go to school for longer days. It already feels like jail. And we went to the lawyers and we s I said, I, I can't testify for longer school days in these conditions. Give them give them multicultural leadership programs at UCLA and Berkeley. Those seem to be flourishing, but longer school days in these conditions. So we didn't. Let, let me tell you about one more project and then I'm gonna shut up, but I will give you your homework assignments. So the other project is just the coolest project I've ever been involved in in my life. Um, friends of mine are um, funders who are very interested in LGBTQ youth. And they're a little discouraged that the dominant story about what do we study on LGBTQ youth? Suicide. Suicide. Bullying. Bullying. Homelessness. Homelessness. Depression. Depression. It gets better. <laughs> Condoms. Okay, so those are the biggies. A lot of money. And most of the research is done on white and some Asian kids in gay-straight alliances. Now these funders, like me, hang out in prisons and foster care and homeless shelters and they've seen a lot of gender non-conforming LGBTQ young people in those settings. They also discovered with us that in the forefront of every youth social movement, check your memory bank, ed reform, dreamers, environmental justice, $15 minimum wage, student debt, and the very lead of those are disproportionate numbers of LGBT young people of color. So much for psychologists who say, oh my God, double discrimination, you must really be broken. There's something quite engaged with a group of young people living at the radical margin who believe they are entitled, but they don't want a seat at the table that we're offering them. They're gonna change the table. Right. So we are now doing a participatory action research national survey. Any of you who can help, please. I have a million postcards. So it's created by young people, a survey of LGBT youth of color throughout the country, all 50, we want 5,000. And we are, we are um, sampling in a variety of places. Am I all right on to, if I do five minutes, yeah. Um, Okay, and um, so, so the way we do PAR projects is we have like a research camp. We invite the people who most know the issues, and as I said, we pool our knowledge. So all these young people who refer to themselves as queer youth from New York City and then lesbian and gay kids from New Jersey who can't believe the New York kids call themselves queer, already we have an issue. Staten Island can't believe anybody's out, so they're all in the room. And I am like the luckiest woman in the world, right? So we show them the, because uh, we always use standard surveys as well as homegrown, right? Because we want to be in conversation with the dominant literature. And basically, it's got a three-part design. There's the coolest advisory board in the world, half adult, half youth, and, and, and national. And everybody works at a funky angle. So we have the head of UndocuQueer. 
We have the head of deaf lesbians of Delaware. We've got, so all these, you know, um, Foster by gay in Arizona because undocumented kids who are gay end up in the foster, right? So people are working these unbelievably interesting Muslim, Muslim lesbians from Toronto are now joining us through Detroit. Anyway, so that's the advisory board. Then we put together this national survey that, and it's, um, you probably know this, but the language is changing around these issues as we speak. Like tomorrow it's gonna to be different. Everything I've said is gonna be politically incorrect and do structural violence to someone's soul because all of those categories are beautifully up for grabs. So I would say this is a gorgeous political moment and empirically a little awkward. Because every time we would write a question, they'd say, I can't believe you're saying lesbian or, I can't, or whatever. So, um, and they're all tweeting and Twittering. So now we're starting to get data from rural Montana and they're all pansexual or demisexual or categories that, uh, anyway, I am the luckiest woman. Um, we know five things so far from this study and it's, um, and it's really quite gorgeous. Oh, just the third part of the design is in February, we're bringing activist LGBTQ groups from Mississippi, Alabama, Tucson, uh, Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, to New York for them to start to analyze the data with us, but also then they're gonna go home and do portraits, oral histories of elders in their community who could you know, stay in a closet or not, but we will then have a gallery and then they're gonna come back for the Pride March to perform their data because we always use theater of the, anyway, it's totally cool. So. I'll tell you about my screw up and the five things we've learned. So my screw up was we had this huge gathering, 150 of them showed up to take, a, a, um, to take the wrong draft of the survey. So we all put together a draft and then we say, here's the wrong draft to another group. Tell us what works, what doesn't work. And um, you know, I'm in a room with a group and I say, you know, we don't wanna do a damage centered survey, so we're not gonna ask, like, we already know about bullying and depression and suicide, and they're like, you need to ask about this. You really need to ask about them, but you need to ask it in a very detailed way. Have you thought about suicide? Have you saved a friend from suicide? When you thought about suicide, who did you talk? It's, it's like a whole section, because it's, it's not like a binary. Every binary has gotten blown open. We have a section called how does injustice get under your skin? Because I'm actually very taken by some of the neuroscience about how oppression moves into the body, even though people are resilient and blah, blah, blah. It moves it. There's a reason black women have high blood pressure, all right? And without blaming their bodies or the sodas they're drinking, it makes you sick. I, you, you ever go to a faculty meeting? Anyway, so. Um, So I say, so what other injustices should we have along this column where you say not at all to very much, totally weird. And this one beautiful brown skin baseball cap goes by the pronoun they, says, you know, every time the cops stop me and frisk me, comma, as though that's the beginning of a sentence, um, and then they feel that I have breasts, they beat me up, right? And I think they're, there are really limits to surveys and yet capturing. So we've got open-ended, we've got, I'll keep you posted. The five very interesting things. One is the story is much more complicated than bullying, depression, suicide, and gay marriage. One of the things they've added are like, ask about the ways we care for ourselves and each other. We've been caring for ourselves since we're seven, since we're 12. Ask us about how we cope with this stuff because we can't tell our parents either because our parents don't wanna know or because their lives are too burdened. My mom already knows I'm a lesbian, but I can't burden her with more of this. Second thing is that, um, well, I, I already said it, that, that they flip the damage conversation to an institutional violence conversation. So one young woman says, you know, I'm fine when I walk down the street by myself, the normal activities of adolescence. But when I hold hands with my girlfriend, that's when cops say, I wanna fuck both of you. And we're like in this room and other people are like, yeah, that happens to me. That, 
Et, or another young person says, you know, I just like touch my girlfriend's nose or my boyfriend's nose in the hallway and teachers say, too much? You all knew this, who, who knew? PDA, everybody know what PDA is? Oh, right, too boring, I didn't, all right. <laughs> so they're like public displays of affection and she says, meanwhile, the straight kids are having sex in the hall and they're calling my parents. I've already told you this thing about radical marginality that we're really interested in, like these multiple marginalizations producing a kind of desire for justice and a kind of chutzpah for justice. Um, all right, enough. I am going to end with, with ears close, it's called bearing withness. With ears close to the ground, committed to public scholarship with communities under siege, critical participatory researchers can hear the tremors before they erupt because we hold ourselves accountable to the communities we work with. I actually think the only way to build in accountability in schools, in communities, in social movements is through participation. It's the only way, there is no metric that's gonna tell us are we doing a good enough job unless we just keep hearing back from the people who are most affected. Participatory work reveals not what's wrong with the people we're studying with because they are the researchers with us, but it reveals how damaged our public institutions are and still how desiring young people remain even after all the betrayals. We have learned, as Nancy Fraser has warned, that redistributive justice is crucial, but so is a justice of recognition, of difference, and I would add a justice of participation. My five homework assignments for LRA. This world really needs you. We need to know what you know. We need to know what you know about literacy. I, I'm in these high stakes testing wars. We need an amicus brief or a policy document for you, from you about per perverse consequences of high stakes and about alternative images of how we can do assessment. In New York City, Mayor Bill de Blasio has moved toward universal pre-K and all of us were excited until a minute later that became the new market for testing. Soon they're gonna be like putting high stakes tests in utero, right? So we need you to say stop. AERA will say it, but it'll be, they're, they're, they can't, won't, whatever. APA, they, they got caught in Guantanamo, they got other problems they're dealing with, thank goodness. The American Statistical Association, everybody has said it quietly. LRA could say it bold, because you could actually uh, give us an image of what else is possible. I, I have to say I'm a little tired of critique alone. I do feel like we need imagination. And, and you all could do that. You could do that as a policy statement, as an amicus statement. All right, that's the first. They get more hostile as I go, and then I'm leaving. Um, <laughs> the second is I, I was taken by Ken's comment last night, and every organization has a crappy history, you know, part of our history is whatever it is. Uh, what would it mean if LRA did a kind of internal process of interrogating your history? A kind of decolonizing from the inside, right? Um, Planned Parenthood was started by Margaret Sanger who had a fair amount of crummy politics, all right? And a fair amount of amazing things, right? So every organization is what Deleuze and Qatari would call an assemblage, right? It's got those sweet progressives like you all, and it's got some hard stuff. We could start a kind of decal, use Ken's sentence, or maybe it's been said before, a a as a beginning to say, how do we interrogate the parts of our history that have contributed to deficit thinking, and how do we, how do we interrogate Maybe we write a collective history. We do oral histories. You make a movie. I, um, I sat with scholars, Palestinian and Jewish Israeli scholars, who wrote the history of Israel. And on this side was the Jewish story, and on this side was the Palestinian story. It's an eighth grade textbook. 
and in the middle are just lines, and the kids are supposed to fill it in, and it's sobering, you know, my God, we got out of Nazi Germany, we finally have a home. Shit, who are these people? They just took my house, right? <laughs> and and it's, it's a very kind of, and, and they'd be fighting with each other, to, but anyway, I, I don't mean to compare you to Israel-Palestine, but I, I do think, uh, it's funny, I wrote a decolonizing of the organization, but, but I wrote de like colonic, anyway, but <laughs> what else? Um, I would be, and I said this to Pat, I, I would be thrilled if the Public Science Project wanted to pair up with LRA and do kind of a critical PAR Institute on literacy work. We do sometimes, <laughs> that would be really fun. Um, I think you need to craft publication guidelines on how to do this work with communities. I know some of you work in institutions where tenure and promotion really honors that and then the other 98% of you work in institution. So it would be powerful if LRA had some publication, tenure, th and then you get Yedda Ken, elders, the rest of us to honor those so that people can submit that when they're submitting their tenure packages. Um, the last obnoxious thing, oh, I have an obnoxious and a hopeful. The last obnoxious thing, I think, um, is that you probably need to think about the role of money and profit and corporate in the literacy world. I just know it's probably really big. Um, and so, you know, I get it, but it's like a cleansing. You know, I'm not asking you all to give up your trust funds. I am saying, let's, you know, there are forgotten alternatives, other turns we could make. We could influence the people who are giving you money rather than rolling over and whatever. My last thing is what would it mean if a bunch of districts or schools that were committed to something very different around assessment actually wrote to the federal government and asked for a waiver, like a cross district waiver on reimagining assessment and it had the endorsement of LRA and if you did it, other organizations might and then we could do a study, a participatory study around language and culture and l teaching and learning and goodbye. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. I'm sure you don't have questions, so we're out of time anyway. For the rest of my life, just email me. You run the risk of your emails being foiled if you email me. Um, but yeah, email me with questions or thoughts, and I'm going to stick around before I leave. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Michelle, and um, we're going to do our homework. We are. We're going to do our homework. We've got about a, a year. Um, that concludes our plenary, and we will begin our business meeting. Pardon? Please stay for the business meeting. Please, please stay. It's a very short meeting. Um, this is where you get to find out where we're going to be over the next four years. So stay. And how much money we have. <laughs>